Word so that we have um, a recording of today's session that will be available for access after the event is over later today. Um, so I have just hit record. Looks like we are ready to go. We have a wonderful session planned for you today. You'll be hearing from some of the top brass from the Mechanical Licensing Collective, um, and they're here to highlight how the different innovative technological advances that have taken place during the past few years within the music industry um, have affected both the musical side and the technological side um, of the recording industry, the music industry, and the technology industry here in Nashville, and how the MLC has been at the forefront of these advancements. So without further ado, I will go ahead and turn everything over to the Chief People Officer at the MLC, Lee McCorkle. So thank you, Lee, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Lauren. We are so happy to be here to tell the MLC story. And it's a great story in uh, what happened in a crazy year last year for all of us. So to get started, first let me just walk through the agenda we have for today and our plan. Now we'd love to tell you a little bit more about our speakers and I'll touch on that next. We have wonderful speakers that can highlight several parts of our presentation today. And it'll include why the MLC, a little bit like what do we do in the first place, an introduction to us, our mission, our culture, how we go at solving our problems. Innovation intersects technology would be just a great section for everybody on the call to hear about what are we doing technically and why is it so innovative. And then last but not least, we hope to just share some of the openings we have at the MLC, um, things you might be interested in, in terms of what about a place for me in your future? And we can touch on that and throughout the presentation. If you have any questions, please put those in the chat. Uh, Katherine Albert, who's on our team, she'll be watching the chat and taking care of those questions. And we'll, we'll certainly have you know, ample time for questions at the end. So let me speak now about our speakers. I'm, I'm so excited that this panel of speakers can be with us today. Um, Raphael Mseli is our technology consultant with the MLC. Raphael is an esteemed professional in technology, especially in the music industry. I've enjoyed working with him very much in the last year. He really has expertise in this industry and he has shown it every day. Um, he'll speak a lot more about the technology we have behind the scenes and walk through uh, how we work and how we use technology. Richard Thompson was going to be with us today and unfortunately minutes before our call today, um, something came up that he needed to attend to and he's not gonna be able to be with us. He certainly sends his apologies. So Raphael's gonna cover for Richard as well and. I think you'll hear a lot of good information um, that Raphael will represent for the both of them. Ali is our HR specialist. Ali uh, supports many of the initiatives at the MLC for our culture and our working environment. And this is a chance for Ali to share something that might be unique for presentations. It's a little bit of how we actually create our culture. And Ali will do a nice job kind of talking about the importance of culture at the MLC. I'm the Chief People Officer at the MLC. I've been here for about a year, loved every minute of it, and watching our team grow from three when I started to about 70 has been just miraculous, and we, we really enjoy our team, so I hope we can share that energy with you throughout the presentation. And our special guest, Dan Navarro, he's just a wonderful songwriter that knows the MLC, knows how we got here, and he'll have a chance to share the why of the MLC from his point of view. You might think of Dan as a little bit like our customer. And he's had a wonderful way of seeing us in the beginning and seeing us to where we are today. So he'll share more about the why of the MLC. So to maybe just get started, I, I thought it might be helpful to give people on the call or on the webinar a little background of what we do and why we do it. Um, a lot of times, most often when I meet people, they think, oh, the music industry is so much fun. But before we get into the meat of the presentation, I thought it might be helpful to give a basic understanding. In the music industry, there are two promises that music companies make to creators of music. Either they promise to cultivate their creativity or pay them accurately and on time. And if a music industry segment says, we wanna cultivate their creativity, that might be a business like a record label or a publisher. For the MLC, we've made a commitment to pay creators accurately and on time, and that's our promise. So more than likely, you know, you've heard 
you've thought about how you've consumed music in the past and you might remember how you've in the past maybe you bought a cd or you heard a song on the radio and then you went to a concert but for the last 10 plus years you've also had a choice to consume music through downloading something off a streaming platform and you've created your own playlist or you've interacted with a digital service provider that gives you the music you like when you want it the whole time you're consuming music songwriters have had the right to be paid if they've created that music and songwriters are paid music royalties when their music is performed on the radio in concerts and over overhead business systems maybe even an elevator but now what we're seeing is a pain point that's really getting solved for the last 10 plus years and it was painfully clear that songwriters were not being paid fairly when their music was downloaded or streamed so in 2018 the rules changed and in 2018 congress signed off on the music modernization act and it effectively made it possible to license musical works and then pay mechanical royalties to publishers and songwriters. It was a huge day for creators and the MLC was created to fulfill this very important mission. And in fact, on our website, you'll see our mission statement. The MLC will strive to ensure songwriters, composers, lyricists, and music publishers receive their mechanical royalties from streaming and download services in the US accurately and on time. So one more thing, you might say, well, what exactly is a mechanical royalty? So you want to think about royalties this way. Um, they're payments, really. Royalties are payments to owners of property for use of that property. They're often payments for the right to use intellectual property. And in our case, copyrighted musical works. So you might think that in the past royalties were paid to owners or administrators of a copyright of a song or recording of the song through CDs or vinyl records or ringtones or permanent downloads, things that were mechanically created. Royalties are paid to either the music publisher who then pays the songwriter or directly to a self administered songwriter. The MLC will distribute those royalties pay those royalties for interactive streams and limited downloads so our i guess consumers of music that you would know apple spotify amazon music soundcloud soundcloud pro and others are digital streaming platforms and that's the usage data that we use to determine how to pay out royalties mechanical royalties we don't distribute royalties for CDs, vinyl records, or permanent downloads. We don't distribute royalties for video streaming. So TikTok is not in our bailiwick. And we don't distribute royalties for public performances or non-interactive streams. So that public performances or performing rights, those royalties are paid through um, organizations like BNI and ASCAP. And we don't pay, does, we don't distribute royalties for synchronization. So that's a little bit of, you know, did you know, and helping you understand a little bit of how royalties work. In the end, royalties are very important to those who create musical works. And Dan is one of those individuals. He's one of those writers. So let me tell you a little bit about Dan and he'll, he'll have a great story to tell as well. Dan has had over 40 years as a career as a songwriter, a recording and touring artist session singer and a voice actor spread over 17 acclaimed albums, thousands of concerts, singing and voice acting in films like Coco and Happy Feet, The Book of Life, Pirates, Pirates of the Caribbean, TV series like American Dad, Prison Break, and Mr. Inglacius. He's also been in hit games, Fallout 4, Red Dead Redemption 2, hundreds of commercials in Spanish and English, and he's written songs for Pat Benatar, the Bengals, Dave Edmonds, and many more. In early 2019, after 20 years with Lowen and Navarro, he released his first studio recorded solo album, Shed My Skin, to rave reviews. He's the personification of the engaged Renaissance artist, even in COVID lockdown, with over 200 housebound live streams since March. Dan insists that art is food, music is love, and like probably many of us, sleep is for babies. 
So I'll turn it over to Dan and thank you for sharing the story of how you see the MLC. Thank you, Lee. Um, I'm happy, I'm proud to be here to speak on behalf of the Mechanical Licensing Collective. I'm a career artist. I've been around, uh, my first song on someone else's album was in 1976 and I was not three years old. I've been doing this a very long time. I've seen the industry change in how artists, are, artists and writers are paid. And the industry that I grew up in was a sort of game of whack-a-mole where you had to chase numbers of record companies and numbers of revenue streams in order to try to get paid fairly. If you were one of the writers at the top of the food chain, it wasn't that hard. If you were an independent struggling to get from here to there, it was nigh on impossible. But the Mechanical Licensing uh, Collective is changing, and this is through the uh, Music Modernization Act, leveled the playing field, opened up the field to artists, for instance, on pre-1972 works, and made us able to start to create a central clearinghouse for the royalties on streaming in particular. Now, Lee talked to you about mechanical royalties. Mechanical royalties date from the days of piano rolls when they were truly mechanical transmissions of this thing called music. Records replace that. Albums, CDs, singles are nearly gone. Yeah, I sell them at my shows. Um, when I was touring, I was doing 100 of them a year. But streaming really did change everything. What the Mechanical Licensing Collective has done is take a granular process that individual songwriters and publishers were trying to, again, the game of whack-a-mole, and turn it into one large compendium for the, for the collection and distribution of these funds. It did change the data lift from the individual to the organization. And this is now a data-driven machine. I'm talking to all of my songwriter and publisher friends, the big ones. This, I've got friends who've written major number one hits, Diane Warren, Billy Steinberg, these are people that are dear friends of mine, but also independents through the, uh, my relationship with the Folk Alliance, people who don't have publishers, people who don't have administrators, and they're out there trying to grab their monies a little as they can. The Mechanical Licensing Collective now levels that playing field so there's a central clearinghouse where they can check their data, and they do have to make sure their data is accurate, but the extent to which it's data-driven is what, to me, is, is the beautiful thing about this. It does put the lift on the organization, and in particular on the talent the organization is able to attract in the technolo technology community to make sure this machine runs smoothly. I'm looking forward to the ability to, to match funds that might have gotten lost out there. How many songs are there that are called Hold On or She Loves You? Dozens upon dozens upon dozens because you can't copyright a title. I could write a song tomorrow called like a rolling stone on a hard day's night. But how those monies end up in the hands of the individual songwriters, that's the Mechanical Licensing Collective's lift. I'm proud to serve on the Unclaimed Royalties Oversight Committee that's going to make sure that the unmatched funds get to the right people. It's all data-driven. The MLC and the MMA have created a pathway to deliver on the promise to songwriters. I want to hand off the presentation now to Allie Brill to share how this path inspired the guiding principles of the MLC. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, yes, working at the MLC, um, we, we view our culture as one of our most important things. Um, and we have four guiding principles that really speak to what that culture is. I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of them. Our first guiding principle is excellent. Um, we just want to make sure that we're excellent in every single thing that we do, whether it's working with our coworkers or working with our community of creatives. Um, as Lee mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, one of our biggest goals is paying the songwriters accurately and on time. Uh, we really want to focus in on our collaboration, our customer service, and our engagement. Our second guiding principle at the MLC is service. It's my personal favorite guiding principle because I went to school in Boston at Berkeley College of Music. I've lived in Nashville for the past five years. I have a lot of friends and loved ones that are songwriters. I love music and the fact that no matter what I do, no matter what we do, no matter how tedious or game changing, um, our work benefits the, these creatives. Um, it allows them to make the music that we all love so much. Um, and we wanna make sure that, you know, whenever we hire people, they know that we're mission-driven um, and service-oriented. Um, 
Our third guiding principle is transparency. Um, we kind of want to be who we say we are. Uh, there aren't any secrets, fails, or curtains with the MLC. And we are happy to take feedback and input from our community of creatives and put that into our business practices. Our fourth and final guiding principle is diversity. Um, we represent a large variety of genres, um, different songwriters, publishers, different people from different thoughts, experiences, and perspectives. And we also wanna see that reflected in the staff and the people that we hire. Um, we feel that our organization is only going to be as strong as those diversities of thought, experience, and perspective. So whether we realize it or not, um, we live and breathe these four guiding principles every single day at the Mechanical Licensing Collective. They are our pillars of success. And up next, I'm just gonna share a couple of quick quotes um, that we reference from time to time at the MLC. Um, Culture isn't just one aspect of the game, it is the game. Everyone talks about building a relationship with your customer. I think build one with your employees first. And finally, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, clearly the culture at the MLC is, is very important to all of us. Um, we wanna make sure our employees are happy and enjoy the work that they do. Um, so it does set the guidepost for the work that we do. And I'd like to turn the presentation over to Raph and Sally to share a little bit more about exactly what we do. Thank you, Ellie. Um, Kat, we can dive straight into the next slide. Um, thank you. So before I go into the, the, the meat of the presentation and the, the, the technical details of what we're doing at the MLC, um, I think it would be useful to describe what we do at the MLC and the, the process that we go through more in business terms. So one of the one of our first um, activities is, and it, it's probably the most important one, is to really engage with the people that are our members or that could be our members. Um, and this is what's under the headline of Connect to Collect. Um, we, we, we try to speak to as many people as we can and um, we educate them on what we do and we try to get them to sign up to the MLC, which is free, so, so everybody should sign up. Um, next stage is, is the play your part headline, which is once um, someone has become a member, whether they're a self-administered songwriter, whether they're a music publisher, whether they're a collection organization, um, they need to make sure that their musical data is in the MLC's database. Uh, and more than that, they need to make sure that it's complete and that it's accurate. Um, at the end of the day, that makes our life a lot easier. So the, the way to do that is, um, th there are many ways, but um, one of the access point is our member portal, which is um, a, an application that I'll go in more details in, in a second. Um, so once we have um, our members data, um, we, we also receive um, DSP's data. Um, so DSP stands for Digital Service Provider, and the way to think of them is the retail end of um, the supply chain. So think about Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, YouTube, all, all those um, organizations that sell you subscription and sell you music. So they, they deliver usage data um, based on the, the, the services that they sell. So we, we, we receive the data, we ingest it, and, and we, we leave it there, ready to be processing, um, which is actually the next stage, um, making the mix. Um, so th this is the step where we combine our data with the data from those DSPs and try to calculate royalties, which is what we need to pay to, to our members. Um, once we've made that mix, um, the next stage is um, probably the most satisfying for, for our members, which is um, getting paid. Um, so at that stage, we, we produce statements, which are financial reports that explain 
what they're being paid, um, what they're being paid on, how much, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as part of, of the process, um, sometimes we, we're not able to, to match the data that we receive from DSP. Um, and um, it's really important that we make that the, the data that we've not been able to match available to, well, to the public at large, really, um, and to external users so that we can complete our database, uh, make sure that it's accurate again, and um, make sure that the next time we can actually match the information. And so this is the, that feedback loop at the bottom of the diagram that you're seeing, um, which is, again, make it, making more data available. Um, so really, to, to, to summarize the, the process, it's exactly what Dan described. It is a data problem. It is a big data problem. Um, I'm not going to go through all the problems that we're facing in details because that, that would take more than the hour. But um, Kat, if you don't mind moving to the next slide, please. We're going to look at three area that uh, three areas that the um, the technical team at DMLC is looking at. So the first one um, concerns the play your part area. The second one, and probably the most obvious one, is to look at DMLC portal. And the third one is how we're making that mix. How we how we're actually able to to process the data. Um, next slide, please. So, um, as, as I said, um, one of the of our primary, one of our first process, one of the things that we need to do first is making sure that we have all the copyright data from, from members and even from non-members. Um, but more than that, we also need to make sure that it's accurate and complete. Um, our, our, our audience is, is very broad and um, with, with a variety of technical abilities. So you, you have um, large organizations that have IT um, department behind them and so they can, they can do a lot of things. All the way to um, self-administered songwriters that, that, that try to, to operate on their own and, and some of them do a really good job actually. So one of, one of our first challenge was to be able to be as open as possible to our broad audience. Second challenge is, is dealing with volumes. Um, so, so some of the people that we're working with, some of those organizations have very large catalog upwards to 2 million compositions. Um, it's, it's, it is a challenge and that, that will be a challenge throughout. Um, obviously, um, data quality is paramount. Um, I, th I think in the, in the tech world, we're all familiar with the garbage in, garbage out um, paradigm. Um, and finally, one of our challenge, again, which is going to be the undercurrent of this whole presentation, um, is time constraints. Um, as Lee highlighted earlier, um, the MMA was signed into act in 20, 20, uh, 2018. Sorry. And the MLC only started, well, last January. So effectively, we've, we've been operating for about a year and we've been building things for about a year. So that's, that's a huge time constraint. So thank you again. Um, so what we built to, to, to solve that problem is what we call the Data Quality Initiative. Um, so, so the goal was really to give a streamlined way for our members um, and non-members non to, to so everybody to compare their data on musical works against the MLC data. And um, obviously then um, provide them a report back to highlight discrepancies so that they can act on that. So what we did was um, build a, and I'm going to use a quote, a simple Java application, um, which, which relies on internal APIs um, to be able to query the data. Um, what you'll find is that we're um, heavily invested in AWS. So we're using as many services as we can. So 
on this particular project, we're using ECS, which is um, Amazon's container service, so Docker for AWS. We're using S3 to store all the data. DynamoDB as, as a way of caching some of the information um, because we, we've got requests coming in quite regularly. We need to be able to retrieve the information quite quickly. And then AWS Transfer Family, which is a fancy way of saying SFTP server. Um, this is a, a way for the DQI participants to interact with the service. Um, what I didn't describe there and that we've built since then is also an administration um, console for our customer service teams so that they, they can help the participants um, and even assist with the process. Um, Um, so the, the, the next area of, of work that, that we've been looking at over the past 12 months is our portal. So building really a world-class interface for our members. And it's, it sounds grandiose, but this is something that there, there is a huge expectation on. So building a world-class interface means a large amount of work and building um, all the belts and braces that make um, all the, the, the music rights holders life easier. So, so obviously our first challenge was a large scope of work. Um, second challenge and that might not be as obvious is the, the music industry is, is really complex. Um, it is very granular that there is a lot of complexities around who can do what, who owns what, etc, etc. So dealing with that complexity and making it into a tool that's easy to use was, was one of the challenges. And um, time constraints and time constraints. Um, again, um, it's one of those things that we had roughly 12, 18 months to build. So that, that was a, a key challenge. So uh, again, to, to repeat the goals a bit, um, what we needed to do was um, design a flexible architecture that allowed us to, to work fast, um, but without sacrificing quality. Um, I, I think more than that, we needed to design a flexible architecture that also allows us to iterate through, through the product. Um, so um, being able to expand on what exists. And obviously, uh, any world-class application needs to be highly available, highly resilient, um, available on multiple devices. So obviously, your computer, your laptop, your tablet, your mobile device. So all that needed to be taken into account. So it, it is a large application, and I can't go into too much detail around how it all hangs together. But here's some of the technical um, tools that we used for, for that particular project. Um, so the first thing that we used is Terraform, which um, for those that are not familiar with, uh, is a declarative infrastructure as code um, tool. So you describe your cloud infrastructure with lines of code, which is great for multiple teams um, working cross organizations. You, you can share the infrastructure quite easily. Um, for, for the flexibility, we looked at service oriented architecture, um, otherwise known as microservices. Um, not, we're not quite at the microservice level, but we're at the appropriately sized uh, level. So we're good there. Um, on the front end, we're using um, fairly tried and tested um, technology, TypeScript, Node.js, and React, which allows us to, to build that multiple device front end. Uh, and again, we're relying quite a lot on AWS. So we're using ECR, ECS for the containerization. Um, we're using Symfony for our backend. Um, Nginx drives all the API. And I've just realized that I, there, there's a typo there. My apologies. Um, and we're using two data store. We're using um, Postgres on RDS. And we're using Elk. Um, not, not so much the Kibana, the K part in Elk, but we're using Elasticsearch for all the search functionalities. 
So that, that's the, the, the portal in a nutshell. The, the next stage in our process that I want to talk about, and that's also a very, very interesting one, um, is the way we process um, the transactions uh, fast and accurately. So what I mean by transaction is all the, the, the lines of reporting that come from the likes of Spotify or Amazon Music um, or Apple Music um, that describe what song was played when, um, how many times, um, and the, the, all, all the parameters that allows us to derive some financial information based on that. So as, as you can imagine, it is large volumes of data. Um, we're talking gigabytes and gigabytes of data every month. So we, we, we need the right infrastructure to process that. A big challenge as well is um, the timelines and the time allocated to process that data. Um, we've got a very compressed timeline to, to process the data from the point at which, at which we receive the usage all the way to the point at which we can report it back to our members. Um, so it, it, is, it is a challenge. On top of that, there are many complex accounting rules, which I won't bore you with, but um, it is something to bear in mind. And again, that pesky time constraints of having only 12 months to build all that. Um, luckily, we, we had um, help on that. So, um, what we build is what we've uh, just named SCORE, which is our, our backend back office system. And our, uh, part of that is our processing engine. So when, when I say R, um, this was built in collaboration with um, Harry Fox, which is our technical vendor and our partner in all our technical endeavors. So it's not something that the MLC did on their own. And, and I want to make sure that I give them the credit. Um, because they, they, they are part of the team. So the goal there was to build a highly scalable, highly resilient, highly parallelized application that can handle large volumes of data, but varying volumes of data. And um, this is where the, the, the term big data takes its full meaning. Um, again, we're having to process gigabytes of data in, in a matter of days, if that. Um, so again, the, the technology is not, is not um, groundbreaking, but it's, it's tried and tested and that, that's, that's um, the undercurrent of what we do, um, especially in the timeframe given. But again, we're using Terraform for infrastructure as code. Um, Retool, which is um, an, an easy to build, easy to implement um, interface um, to interface with all our data and basically give us a dashboard, a, a map build console for our users. Um, we use Ruby um, to, to build um, the code and again, ECR, ECS for the correlation, S3 for um, storing those large usage file. Um, Lambda and step function to orchestrate the whole process because um, it is a very linear process for each usage file. And then um, Postgres to do all the calculation and the, and, and the, and the storage of data. So, um, I mean, as, as you can see, and it's, it, we, we're working on many projects, many different projects. Um, and um, we, with a wide variety of technologies, um, but th this is only the beginning, th th there is more to come. So now that we've looked at the tech side of things, I wanted to just give you a flavor of what the team looks like um, and um, what makes us great uh, because the team is great. So um, as, as you might have gathered from my um, accent, I'm not actually from the US, I'm not actually from North America. 
Um, I'm not even from the UK. Um, I'm, out, I'm originally from France, but we've got many people from different origins um, in the team. We've got people from Canada. I'm the one from France. We've got people from the UK, uh, obviously from the US. Um, so that, that's, that's great. That means different cultures. Um, they, they all bring a variety of things to, to, to the team. Not everybody comes from the music industry, so that's great because that means that they can also bring a, a different angle to, to how we need to do things. Um, so we've got people from the fashion industry, people from the healthcare industry, people from the marketing industry. Um, that, that brings us a different angle um, to, to, to the team. Um, obviously, we've got multiple um, people com from, coming from different technical backgrounds. Um, I'm more of a back-end guy. Um, we've got front-end engineers, we've got DevOps engineers. Um, our CTO would say that he's a database guy um, and um, big data, obviously, which is a big part of what we do. Um, overall, I think, and um, I, I might have been a bit... Um, um, low on that estimate, but we've got over a hundred years of combined technical experience, um, which is which is great. Um, what's also great is that we don't all think that we know it all. So if you if you come on board, um, we we want to hear what you've got to say. So um, I think we've got a, a great team and um, a great organisation to make a difference. Um, I hope that the presentation gives you a flavor and idea of, of what we do, who we are, and what we're trying to achieve. Um, I'll turn over to Lee now um, to tell you more about um, opportunities and how to be part of the MSC's future. Thank you, Rafe. This is good. It's, it's good to actually sit back and see how much work has happened in the last year. You and the team have just been phenomenal. and an incredible lift of something that didn't even exist 12 months ago. So it's really been truly amazing. Um, you know, I, I saw something yesterday that was eye-opening for me. It was a report from an organization called Medea that does a lot of research on the music industry. And, you know, things are coming out now about how 2020 looked in all kinds of industry sectors, including the music industry. And it was interesting to see that um, global re recorded music revenues did grow last year, 7% in 2020, and reached $23.1 billion in record label trade revenue terms. And of that 23.1 billion, 62% of that was for streaming music. Streaming music revenue accounts for 62%. So it's truly um, you know, game changing in the music industry to see so much headed towards streaming music. And we're, we're glad where we are. And I think as Rafe's mentioned more, more than once, time constraints, how do we just get, get there as fast as we can to keep up with the industry and to keep up with the service uh, potential that we have to provide creators? Part of that really goes back to our team. It's a talented team and we couldn't be here without that talented team. And at the same time, we know we're growing and we're gonna need more help. So what I'd like to do is just kind of talk about some of the opportunities we have. We filled some of our openings, of course, to this point. And I also want to say thank you to a couple of recruiting partners who work closely with us between, you know, who we know and how we post jobs and find individuals. We've gotten a lot of good help from VACO and Otterbase. They've been recruiting partners and they've helped us find talent that really fits our needs and they know our business. So we are very appreciative for their help. Let me just kind of give you an idea of what we what we have in front of us and maybe what's to come. Right now, we have an important role that's posted for a technology team lead. It's a leadership role that will build and lead a team, a software engineering team. Certainly, as, as Rafe mentioned very time, many times, we want to hear what you think and how we can create something that's not been done before. Lead the technical design, be involved in, de in the decisions at the team or project level really start to define our development env environment and standardize our practices. It's an important role, we're ready for it. And I think we're continuing to build out our team in partnership with HFA and 
getting stronger as we move forward into uh, 2021 and 2022. We know our technology team is strong and we're gonna get even bigger and better. The royalty distribution process coordinator is tangential to the technology team. It's a strong project management role that will help us track royalty distribution from usage ingestion to paying the checks. And it's a, a role that's very critical to watch our, <clears throat> our process throughout you know, several key milestones to make sure every time we have a cycle of paying royalties, we do it better and better each time. And then, you know, we'll continue to shape what we need and fill roles as we need them. But it's likely that these are the future roles and skills that we will need. We'll probably need more software engineering support. We'll probably need test engineers, data engineers, business analysts. Business analysis is something that will be continuing to be a need for us. Data analysis, automation, technical project leaders. I think we'll see needs for those roles in the future. So if you still think, hey, I'm really kind of interested in keeping up with the MLC, but there may not be just the job for me right now, that's okay. We still would love to have a connection, a relationship with you. So if you are interested, we're gonna be hiring in the future as well as now. And you can visit our careers page at the MLC.com. So when you go to that site, if you wanna see what we have open today and what we need today, you can look at for those specific jobs. If you want to stay in touch with us and be part of our network where we can reach out to you and say, hey, guess what we've got going on? There's a private list that we maintain for networking and you can apply to a, a, a job title in our careers page called Technology Opportunities. And if you want to stay in touch with us, if you'd like to be part of our future, we'd love to have you connect with us that way. So those are two great ways you can stay in touch with us as we you know, continue to build the organization and look forward to what's ahead for our technology team. Now, it looks like we have a few questions. Um, so Kat, um, maybe you can help us go through some of the questions. I think a few of them have been answered already. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. why don't you let us know what question you have that you'd like us to answer. And uh, I'm sure one of us on the team can, can jump in. That sounds great. Um, a question for Raf uh, from Lori. Raf, do you, we have a main language that you use in your backend, or is it a combination of languages? Um, she heard us mention Java and Symphony and Ruby, so she's curious if we use one more than the rest. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, so cur currently, we, we looking at what fits the bid in terms of the requirements and that's getting um, up and running as quickly as possible. So for the, the data quality initiative, Java made sense because well, that, that's, that's all we had available in terms of skill set at that point, And that's all we knew. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned Symfony in the, in the portal backend. Um, again, that was mostly based on, on what we had available. Some, some of that work was outsourced, and so they, they used Symfony and PHP to do that. Um, and um, but then, then there's no reason why we couldn't shift to a Java backend, for example, there. Um, and again, um, on the, the score application, um, Ruby was was a choice made by by our technical vendor um, Harry Fox. So I, I don't think there is a preferred language. It's more a question of what's the most appropriate tool for for the job. Um, for example, we we've just hired a um, test automation engineer, and she's going to be working um, using Ruby initially because that's what she is more comfortable with and that that's what makes uh, most sense to her. So the, the right tool for the job is the short answer. Great, thank you, Raf. Which is a great transition into um, our next question. Is the Harry Fox Agency a competitor of the MLC, similar to the way that BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC are competitive PROs? Or do you coordinate, collaborate with Harry Fox? So from a technical point of view, um, Harry Fox is very much our partner. Um, they're, 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 they're helping us build all, all the systems that we need to build. 
from from purely from a commercial and business point of view, um, the, the Music Modernization Act makes it very clear that our, our mandates are very separate. And, and so we, we're not working on the same parts of the music industry. So we, we're not effectively competing, competing for the same market, uh, which makes it useful. And I don't know if um, um, Dan or Lee have, uh, have a better answer being the <laughs> more of the cool face than I am. <laughs> Would anyone else like to jump in? Are we good? Okay, we can keep going. Um, the next question is, how does the MLC collect and deal with overseas publishing data and clients, music publishing companies, and or self-administered songwriters in other countries whose music is played and consumed in the U.S.? So I, I don't mind taking that one um, as well. So, <laughs> um, uh, so ex-US CMOs are one of the, the, the many members that we're dealing with and they're very much entitled to become members of the MLC. They're very much entitled to sign up to the portal and start delivering data in that way. So uh, I've been talking to a number of them. Um, I can't remember from the top of my head how many we've, we've engaged with, but um, anyone that has um, music being consumed in the US is, is very much entitled to join the MLC and to work with us. I might just jump in quickly. Um, so we have a leader on our team who is the head of international relations, Indy Chawa. She's based in the UK as well. I think she's had engagements with maybe 80 to 90 different CMOs around the world. Uh, I think we are showing up on every continent except Antarctica. I, I don't think we have anything on, on Antarctica, Antarctica, but she's really engaged in um, a lot of the CMOs around the world and uh, growing it every day. Yeah. Thank you. There was a question in the chat and Rath, this one's for you. With a great concern for data transitioning global networks, do you keep data in specific EU AWS zones? Is AWS and US only zones an option? So we, we're currently we're only in um, US zones um, with AWS. Um, we're, we're, we're both on the US East and US West to, to, to be a bit more specific. Um, there isn't currently a need for us to, to go more globally um, because our volume and to, to the latency that don't really justify it. Um, I think that would be the reason why uh, we would do it. Um, I, I'd be interesting to, to, to hear what the, what the security concerns are around data transit, transiting through the networks. Um, it's, it's not something that I've really thought about. So um, yeah, that, that's an interesting angle that I will look into for sure. Thank you. Um, so another question is, is the MLC planning an API for third-party applications to tap into MLB data? Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, so one of the things that I didn't touch on is um, part, part of, our, of the work that we do is to make our database of, of work available publicly. Um, and um, <laughs> This is where I'm going to be the, the tech guy and very cynical. The DMMA was written by lawyers for lawyers. So when they described how we should do that, they said in a computer and human readable format. So not, not being clear at all there. So our, our approach and our interpretation has been to look at web search, um, a, a bulk download of the data and APIs. Um, so far, we've built the web search and the bulk download. Um, APIs, we're hoping to have ready by the end of the year, but um, not, not, uh, not making promises here. Um, but that, that's something we're looking at, absolutely. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, so for, we have a question about how is your adoption plan for getting members going? Are you getting traction with artists and writers signing up? 
Um, I, th I think it's it's going it's going pretty well. Um, we've got to date close to eleven thousand members, um, including some writers, including CMOs, including publishers of varying sizes, um, and and we're actively reaching out to 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 more people to make sure they know about us, um, that we that they know we exist and that they should be signing up with us so they can start collecting all the, the streaming income from the US. Thank you. Um, okay. Music publishing catalogs are frequently sold in changing ownership's hands. How does the MLC plan to keep its databases updated to make sure royalties are calculated correctly and paid to the proper catalog administrators? I don't mind taking that one again. Um, it's it's an interesting question because that's probably the area where we've got um, the least amount of control. Um, we, we can build the tools and we can then make them as, as, as great as possible. What we need is for people to use them. So, so what I mean by that in that context is that um, it, it's up to the, the, the songwriters, the publishers and the CMOs to come to us and to deliver the data. And then we'll do our best to ingest it as quickly as accurately as possible. But the source of the data has to be from the rights holders. They're, they're the ones that know their catalogs. They're the ones that know when, it, when they're changing hands as well. And so, so letting us know is, is paramount. Um, that's, that's, that's the answer. We, 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 we can build the tools and we will build the tools, but they, they need to get used basically. Um, a question just popped into the chat before we get ready to wrap up. Um, who are our competitors? That's 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 a great question. So from so so fr from a pure business point of view, the, the way the way the MLC is set up, I, I don't think there is that notion of competition because we're here to to serve the the, the songwriters and and all the rights holders so we we we're passing 100 percent of the royalties that we collect we're not for profit so we we we, we don't have that that commercial incentive or need to be competitive um from from a technical point of view uh <laughs> My ambition is for us to be the, the, the standard in terms of, of technical music organizations. Um, and, and so, I mean, I can, I can think of two or three organizations that are um, currently uh, of, of a good standard that, that obviously we, we, we're quite young organizations, so we've got some catching up to do, but I'm, I'm hoping that we can compete on, on that technical playground with, with those organizations. Um, I, I won't name names. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just leave it here. Um, but, the, but, the, but, the, but there is there is some ambition to be, to be um, a, a world-class tech organization as much as a world-class uh, music collection agency. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Raph. I'll say there's a question about memberships and about how to work with the MLC. I would um, recommend going to the MLC's website and typing on membership, and you can get lots of answers there and also reach out to our customer experience team, customer support team, and they'll be able to answer that specific question for you. Lee, do we, um, are we getting ready to wrap up? I'll I think so. I, I think it's a good time to wrap up and, um... That's a nice segue. So if you do have interest, you know, from a songwriter point of view and you'd like to learn more or you have friends who are songwriters, you can reach out to an email address called support at the MLC.com. That'll go to our support group and they are fantastic. They're wonderful. Um, there's also a phone number if you want to call MLC support 615-488-3653. So for those of you on the call today who have songwriter interest, for you or friends of yours, those are great places to turn. Um, I've really enjoyed this, you know, myself. Uh, I love hearing from our team. We think we have something special. And again, if you want to stay in touch with us, you know, please do so by networking with us. I want to thank 
Ray just did a fantastic job with like what happens behind the scenes at the MLC for technology. Dan, I can't thank you enough for joining us. It's a real treat to have you part of our team. Um, you know, whether it's on a strategy or on a call, it's always good to have you with us and we appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, being with us, for Allie, for all she does every day to share the story of our culture. And we think that's extremely important for us because culture does eat strategy for breakfast every morning. We wanna make sure we have a healthy culture. For Kat, thank you so much for taking care of the slides, being there for recording the questions. And of course, for Lauren and Dominique, um, we just couldn't be here without you, literally. <laughs> and we're very glad that you could give us a chance to be part of your organization. Um, it's a great partnership and uh, I think that's how we make it happen. So thanks again. And if you'd like to reach out to us, I'm sure we can see you in LinkedIn or you can drop us a note through our, our website. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Um, I will go ahead and end the recording and we will get this posted later on today for anybody who needs access. Um, but feel free to, as we mentioned, reach out to the MLC directly if you'd like more information. Thanks so much. Bye everybody, have a good week.